Let's pray. Oh, Father, we do come to the altar. You've said in your word that we come boldly to the throne of grace when we come in and through your Son, Jesus Christ. He is the reason we exist. He is the reason we are your children. He is the reason we're saved. Praise be to him. Thank you that we can sing your praises and that we can pray prayers to you and you love us. You look at us and you delight in us because of the work of your son whom you call your servant. His name is Jesus. Father, as we are gathered here in Lexington at a church called Meadowview, we remember that you have people of every tribe and nation and tongue Not only in North Carolina or the United States, but in all over the world, in places like Haiti and Jamaica and Peru and Syria and Iran, all over, Lord. And that brings you pleasure. And so we unite our hearts with Christians from around the world, knowing that we live in different places and different, uh, under different governments, Lord, and, and some places it's very dangerous to be a christian and we just lift up those persecuted christians around the world as we live in comfort here in an air conditioning and we can still freely proclaim your name we know that freedom is not for everyone so strengthen them and help them to feel the love of your son jesus We pray for the needs within our own church, Father. There's people in the hospital, people grieving grieving loss of loved ones, people facing um, procedures, disease. Each one here has people they know. We want to lift those prayers up to you now in the silence of our hearts. And Father, each of us have friends and family, loved ones, neighbors, co-workers that we just wish would come to faith in your Son and experience salvation and new life. We lift them up to you now, Lord. Father, we're here now to hear from you, from your word, Lord, your love letter to us. You saw it fit and good to write all this for us thousands of years ago, and it's every bit as important as it was then. So please open our eyes and our ears and give us soft hearts to hear what you have for us, Lord, in the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ, as we look forward to the celebration of his resurrection. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So hopefully uh, my assistant gave you the handout. Uh, We're in Isaiah chapter 50, and we'll explain what we're doing um, in a minute. What I'd like to do is read the whole thing. Um, Actually, we'll read from verse 4 to 11, but then we'll go verse by verse through it as we have been. And so these prophecies in Isaiah, in this section of Isaiah, are called the servant songs in Isaiah because Jesus Christ is referred to as God's servant. We see that in verse 10 of our text today. Please listen as I read the word of God. Verse 4 and following. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. 
But the Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint. And I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord your God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like garment, like the moth will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Behold, all you who kindle a fire, who equip yourselves with burning torches, walk by the light of your fire and by the torches that you have kindled. This you have from my hand, you shall lie down in torment. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yes. Okay, so when you read these passages in Isaiah, just going back here, when you read these servant songs in Isaiah, and oftentimes this happens in what's called the poetic literature in the Old Testament, the, the Psalms, um, the prophecies, Isaiah, Ezekiel. Like, it's hard to make out what's going on because it is actually poetry. That's why in your Bibles, it's not just long sentences that go on across the page and are nice and justified, but they're, they have a cadence to them. So you'll see it, and then you'll see like it's indented, and then the next line starts, and it's indented. It's because it's poetry. And so what we've been doing is going through these four uh, servant songs, in this section of Isaiah, which speaks of the servant of the Lord. And so we've done 42, 49, now we're in 50. Now last week, Pastor Pablo taught on the Davidic covenant. And so uh, since the way these weeks work out, I, I'll do the servant songs and he'll be teaching again next week. Do you know what you're teaching on? Yes. You could. Okay. Does anybody know what the previous covenant before the Davidic covenant was? Those are both before. I, I, I would guess the one immediately before would be the Mosaic, but we're going to do the Mosaic covenant. Okay. Okay. So these, so we're taking this time leading up to Easter, and 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 Holy Week, Good Friday, um, Easter, uh, Good Friday and Easter Sunday, uh, to look at these Old Testament prophecies that point to fulfillment in Jesus Christ, particularly in His work. And so, but just to remind you of some of these other servant songs as we get into today's text. So just a New Testament passage that also kind of confirms or affirms the use of the word servant for Jesus. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. And as you go on, you see that this is clearly Jesus Christ being called God's servant who was raised up. And it's complicated language because, of course, Jesus is fully God. And yet what we see in these prophecies is he's described as a man. And so we don't, we don't lose that, that, that Jesus is very God, but he is very man. And in his experiences in life as a man who lived perfectly sinless, um, you know, he was tempted in all ways except without sin. And so that makes him a sympathetic high priest. That's why we can have a substitute because it needed to be a man. It couldn't be an animal like in the Mosaic Covenant. Um, had to be a human being who lived perfectly. So the first servant song we did was in Isaiah 42.1. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, just some key verses. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him and he will bring forth justice to the nations. And we saw that at Jesus Christ's inauguration, at his baptism, this is what's playing out. Here it says, I put my spirit upon him, and we see the spirit descending upon him like a dove, and God saying, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. 
I love the way it says here in Isaiah, in whom my soul delights. I'm pleased. And how beautiful. We saw in the sermon a few weeks ago how Jesus Christ has done all things well. That's why God is pleased with him. Uh, Later in in that same servant song, I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness. I will give you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant. And so Pastor Pablo was talking about these covenants and how Jesus Christ is the very covenant. And when we celebrate communion, it's this is the covenant in my blood, he says. Covenant made by his own blood. And then again, a light for the nations. And so this, this focus to the Jewish people about this servant is coming for the nations. And when a Jewish person would be reading this, they're saying, well, the nations, what about us? We're in exile. It ends, behold, the former things have come to pass and the new things I now declare before they spring forth, I tell you them. And praise God that he does. This is one of the reasons we know Christianity is true. Of course, the Spirit testifies in our hearts that it's true, but God has told us beforehand what's going to happen, and then it comes about. And the book of Isaiah does this hundreds of prophecies that have been fulfilled in history, in the nations around the world that archaeology has confirmed, and yet we know that it was written before. And so God's word is true, and um, we can count on it. And that's some faith that we have. And this whole concept of the former things have come to pass, the new things I now declare. He's doing this through his, per, his son, Jesus Christ, the servant. Revelation ends this way, right? The old has passed away, the new has come. And then we as Christians are called new creations in Jesus Christ. The old of ourself has passed away and we have, we're new birth. And so the work starts with us. And as we are redeemed, we are helping bring about a redeemed creation. And one day he will restore all things, new heaven and new earth. Last week, or two weeks ago, we did Isaiah 49. And we saw this servant, he's saying, He made my mouth like a sharp sword in the shadow of his hand. He hid me. He made me like a polished arrow in his quiver. He hid me away. And we saw how... The person of Christ was hidden all throughout the Old Testament, and yet the the New Testament talks about him now being revealed. And he's a weapon in the hand of God. But we know all those New Testament verses speak about the sword of the Spirit and the Word of God like a sword. So this sword that's going to bring about righteousness from the nations does so by the very Word of God for their redemption and judgment. And so in this servant song, it was fascinating because it said, it talked about the nations and the coastlands. And it's like, wait a minute, I thought God is writing to the Jewish people, to his children, and he's writing to the nations. And he says, listen to me. And then he says, I'm bringing a sword. And that's scary. And then we see what his job is. It's to redeem the nations. What a beautiful thing. I just love this, Isaiah 49, 6, and it's quoted in Luke 2, 32. It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. God's saying, like, that's too easy for me just to redeem the Jewish people. If if I'm sending you to die, let's redeem the world. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Like, we're going big, (laughs) And then that will bring glory to me. Because we remember that God's people didn't start with Abraham. It started with Adam. He wants them all back. And then this key verse that I know uh, we, we, covered, we covered this in the Exodus class too. So he says, you are my servant Israel in whom I am glorified. The sense of it is, Israel is supposed to be my servant, who glorifies me, but they don't. And you look at the surrounding passages in Isaiah, and you see that they clearly don't. So you are my servant, who will bring me glory. And I call you Israel. And this is where we get covenant, I mean, this all wraps into covenant theology and who God is and how he brings about his plans with Adam, with Israel, and then fulfillment in Christ. So, to trace it, 
I should really have on here the Adamic covenant with an, an Adam. So Adam is called God's son, and Adam falls, bringing the human race to destruction. So Israel, and, and so you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob's name is turned to Israel. So they're the father of the nation Israel. They're in captivity in Egypt. So God sends Moses, let my people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, so Moses to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. So the nation of Israel now is like the replacement of Adam. They're the, it's the new Adam. And yet, it does the same thing as the old Adam. And that's the pattern. So in Hosea, hundreds of years, maybe thousands or a thousand years later, I don't remember when Hosea is written in the context of Exodus and all that. But Hosea says this, when Israel was a child, and again, Israel was called a child, I loved him and out of Egypt I called him. So it's referring to the Exodus very clearly. In the Old Testament, they would read this as, well, this is the Exodus. But Matthew, when Jesus is born and he goes into Egypt, it says, this was to fill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Now who was called out of Egypt? Israel. And so Jesus Christ is, is, very, is very clearly being shown as the new or the true Israel. And that was what we read in Isaiah 49.3. He said to me, you are my servant Israel. And so... And I, I put the videos online, you could see them. And I know I go through this quick. Um, and, and again, this is online, you could see it. But you see in Israel's history, these events, very significantly. Life, as the new Israel retraces those steps. God's starting over. He tried with Adam. He tried with the nation of Israel. Now he's going to do it with his own son. And that's the way this works. And so, you know, they were trying, you know, Pharaoh was trying to kill the babies and then Herod was trying to kill babies. They're called, Israel's called the firstborn son, so is Jesus. Even the language of the nation, the nation grew and became strong and found favor with God. That's the language that's used in Luke 240 of Jesus. And the child grew in, in, in stature and favor with man and, and with God. And so you see that. Um, 40 years in the wilderness, 40 days in the wilderness, 12 tribes, 12 apostles. Jesus Christ is the new Israel. This was maybe complicated for some of you, but the point was, the <laughs> Wayne laughs, you're an engineer. Okay. God starts with Adam. Then he starts over with Noah. Then he starts over with Abraham. But not all of Abraham's children are Israel because he chooses Isaac, not Esau. But not all of Esau's children are Israel because he chooses, uh, I'm sorry, Isaac or Ishmael, uh, he chooses Jacob, not Esau. And, and then you get this in, in the prophets. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Like nobody can do this. And so God's people gets narrower and narrower and narrower until it's compressed into one person, Jesus Christ. The new Adam, the new Israel. And then from Christ, it spirals outward. And we see that in the book of Acts as it leaves the person of Jesus Christ and goes out to the nations. And so once again, he can then get all of, of Adam's, you know. It starts out with the nation of Israel, and then it goes out to all of the children of Adam and Eve. Okay. So I, I, we got to move on here with this. Um, Let's get to today's text. Why I tell you that is because Isaiah 42 says, I make you the servant a covenant. And Isaiah 49 says, I make you the servant are actually Israel. In other words, you're the representative for all the people. So in, in, in uh, the first three verses here, they don't really consider this a part of the servant song, but it's really kind of interesting how it feeds into it. So the Lord is talking to Judah, which is the Jewish people, Israel. Thus says the Lord, where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? 
Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? They're in exile, or it's foretelling their exile. Again, I'm in the history, I'm a little foggy on that right now. And, he, and, and basically the people are saying like, well, God is no longer our God. He's abandoned us. And God's saying, well, where's the certificate of divorce if I abandoned you? The reason you've been sent away is your iniquities. You were sent away. But it doesn't mean I'm not your God. And then he says, why when I came, was there no man? Why when I called, was there no one to answer? Again, that, that, in, that, in that chart, as it's narrowing down, like there's nobody good enough. There, and there's nobody who listens, right? And nobody follows after God. No, not one. Then God says, is my hand shortened that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Then he talks about the judgment he can bring, but this was just interesting. I clothe the heavens with blackness and make sackcloth their covering. In other words, the heavens are mourning over the state of humanity. And I know we mourn over the state of humanity. So to, to the song. So now you have in the first person the servant speaking, and you have these verses in your text there. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. So here the servant is actually like a disciple of God. He's hearing from God. In the Gospels, and I have more verses there, but I just chose this Matthew one, but in your paper for further study. And coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? He speaks as somebody with authority, and the Gospels keep showing you that. And it's because he's learned it right from God. This is 1 Corinthians 1.30. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. I mean, Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God. Again, these verses are on your sheet. So as you follow down, you should see him to your right. So how is God teaching the servant? And again, we, I, I know it's, co it's, it's complicated because Jesus is God. Why does he need to be taught? But he has to go through everything as a man to redeem us. And so how he suppressed whatever knowledge he had or his powers. I mean, there's times where Jesus says, you know, nobody knows, not even the son knows when this will happen, only the father. So somehow in, 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 when the word became flesh, there were certain things he was limited to knowing in the moment, but not limited in his power to know it. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. Isn't that, do you remember that in Jesus' ministry? And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And you see all throughout Jesus' ministry, it was this like, you know, a lot of y'all are like, we got to do morning devotions and wake up early. Well, Jesus did it. <laughs> he was sustained by the Spirit and his relationship by the Father. The Father instructed him and taught him. And this is just beautiful. This goes back to that other servant song where, where it said, he will not, you know, a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not. Like he's, he's there for compassion to sinful rebels like us. To sustain with a word him who is weary, and of course, come to me all who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I mean, that's Jesus says that. Take my yoke upon you. My burden is easy. My burden is light. I mean, when you look down that paper I gave you, and you see all the New Testament cross-references down that right column, it's just, it's just unfathomable. <laughs> all that's there. Um, actually, I don't have a slide for this. I'm glad I actually looked at the sheet. Let's look at that morning by morning. There's another time in the Old Testament when that's, that phrase is used, morning by morning. It's in the Exodus 
when they were fed manna in the wilderness, it said, and morning by morning, they went and they, they got the bread. The bread that would feed them, right? And then in Mark's gospel, as we've been studying, you guys have seen, like, Jesus says, don't you understand the loaves? Don't you understand the bread? I'm the bread of life. I feed you in the wilderness. But, but what is Jesus feeding you with? He, he's, he's feeding you with himself, with his word. You'll eat this bread, you'll just be hungry again. The bread he gives us is, is, is everlasting. And so it, it's an interesting connection, I think, because morning by morning, like I said, the other time it's used is in that context where they're going out and gathering the bread. And here, morning by morning, Jesus Christ is, is receiving fellowship and teaching and being fed by the Father. And then Jesus says in Matthew uh, 4.4, 4, Man, uh, when he's being tempted by Satan, man does not live by bread alone, but by what? By every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And isn't that what this is saying? When you look at that, and then you look at that, that rising every morning, Jesus is being fed by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Just like in the wilderness, morning by morning, they were being fed by actual manna. We call it bread. Uh, the Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. Um, Jesus, is he's on mission. He knows what his mission is. Philippians 2.8, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even, even death on a cross. And so, in other words, he, he was dedicated to the mission. He is the suffering servant. That's going to be some of the next servant songs that we do. I gave my back to those who strike and cheeks to those who pull out the beard. That doesn't sound fun. <laughs> I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. And in Matthew's gospel, twice we see that they spit in his face and they struck him. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. How? I mean, do you ever think about that? Like, how grotesque is crucifixion? to be spit on he created them <laughs> they're gonna spit on him that's our savior i hid not my face from disgrace and spitting and then verse 7 says but the lord god helps me therefore i have not been disgraced so humanly speaking there's they're disgracing me but i know my identity so I'm not disgraced. Therefore, I've set my face like a flint. That's a very hard thing. That's, that's the point. And I know that I shall not be put to shame. There is so much in these verses. There's so much. So I've set my face like flint. So they're, they're putting me, they're trying to disgrace me. I'm being spit on and beaten. But God is my Father put it in today's terms or New Testament terms. And so I know my mission. And I'm not going to be discouraged and I'm not going to be swayed. Does Satan contempt me in the wilderness? Not abandoning my mission? I can be tempted in the garden of Gethsemane and the Spirit will strengthen me? I've set my face like flint. So first to the disgrace, and then we'll talk to set my face to flint. Disgrace, disgrace, he won't be put to shame. This is a graphic I found. I don't know if it's very legible. It's Hebrews 12, 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. This is a beautiful verse. Who for the joy that was set before him. So it's, it's out in front of him. And what is it? The cross? The joy of you and you. And you, being a part of the family, for the joy that was set before him, that's how he was able to endure the cross. The joy of being with the, back with the Father in glory, but having redeemed his people. Despising the shame. It's like he laughed at the shame. And he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. 
People try to disgrace him, but he knows he's who he is. He will not be disgraced, and so he shall not be put to shame. He has set his face like flint for the joy set before him. He's going to the cross. And that's what exactly what Luke 9.51 says. When the days draw near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Now in John's gospel, when, when this is about to happen, it's Lazarus is, is dead, and the Jews want to kill Jesus, and Jesus says, we got to go see our friend Lazarus. I think he said he was asleep. I'm not sure if he said he was dead. And they said, well, if we go there, we're going to die. And he said, well, that's where we're going. And, and Thomas, who we call Doubting Thomas, Thomas is awesome. He says, that's where we're going to go then. In other words, if Jesus is going, that's where we go. And he goes to Jerusalem knowing full well. And, and the beauty of this is he kept saying, my time has not yet come. My time has not yet come. My time has not... Now my time has come. Full control over what was going to happen to him. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. <laughs> He is so confident in the mission. We're going to come back to these two verses. Uh, he who vindicates me is near. We, we did this last week or two weeks ago when we did the servant song in Isaiah 49 when it said, like, he looked over creation and, and he was just discouraged. But it said, but however, I know God is just and he will vindicate. And so we, w- we won't recover those verses. They're in the last one. But they're, they're in your you're in your paper there and of course well just one of them so of course like in in philippians 2 you know he lowers himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross so god then highly exalts him to the uh, to his right hand to the name that is above every name so that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that jesus christ is lord so so the vindication is in the resurrection of christ i mean that's what we're looking for you know and 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 jesus is that's why you know, Psalm 2, sit at my right hand till I put your enemies at your, at my, at your footstool. Like, okay, your work is done. You may sit down. <laughs> Vindication. So this rounds the corner now as, as you hear that, as you hear the servants, um, I mean, it, it starts to give you those illusions and those, those indications that he's going to suffer. And then Isaiah 52 and 53, we're really going to see the suffering. But the point here is he has been fed by God. Um, we already know that the Spirit is upon him. He's walking in the Spirit. And he's obeying God even into what looks like disgrace. He knows what's on the other side of it. For the joy set before him, he then goes to Jerusalem, to the cross, and he will be vindicated. So who among you now fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Now remember back to the beginning. Verse 2. Why when I came was there no man? Why when I called was there no one to answer? Why did nobody hear me? So now, who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice? I'm calling again. Will you obey? We believe. Let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. I mean, like every verse in this, it just was like, it's all New Testament. <laughs> Let him who walks in darkness and has no light. I mean, that's what, in Ma- when Jesus is born in Matthew's gospel, it's qu- actually quoting back from Isaiah 9.2. But those who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. That's, Jesus comes. He's the light. The point is we're all walking in darkness and have no light. Will we have ears to hear the voice of the servant? Because he is what? He is, he is Israel. The New Testament tells us he's the new Adam. Like, do we want to be represented by him? Because without him, why when I came was there no man? When I called, there was no one to answer. Is, is my hand shortened that I cannot redeem? Or my 
Where's my power to deliver? I send the servant to be your representative. Do you have ears to hear his voice? And of course, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. It just reminds us, of course, of of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will uh, direct your paths or make them straight. Out of Old Testament. So this is... This is, this is amazing. You see here that the, the fate of humanity is wrapped up in who the servant is. That's what it's saying. And obeys the voice of his servant, right? Jesus says, what, what must you do? <laughs> Believe in me. Be represented by me. And so the will of the Lord is the will of the servant. There's no double-mindedness, and we saw that. So then it says, trust in the name of the Lord. Well, I mean, the New Testament tells you, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, call to be saints together with all those who are in every place. Call upon the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ. The servant and God are one both their lords and ours. And then, of course, Acts 2.21, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Acts goes on to say, there's salvation in no other name under heaven or under earth except for Jesus. (laughs) Jesus is the Lord. And so when the New Testament talks about calling upon the name of Jesus and calling upon the name of the Lord as Jesus, you have to understand the Old Testament tells you this over and over and over, that salvation is in the name of the Lord, yet it's hidden that his servant is the Lord until we get to the New Testament. Which part? Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, no, the demons... The demons say Jesus is Lord, and they don't, well, they call him God. I mean, so, you know, you were, I think you were here Sunday. We talked about the three levels of belief. So there's the information, so the knowledge, the agreement or the assent to the knowledge. So the Pharisees had level one, right? They knew that Jesus was claiming to be God. I proved that when he was they that's why they tore their garments you can't only God can forgive sins what are you saying you're God but they didn't believe that he was God the demons have both they know he says that he's God and they agree he's God the third one is what this one's referring to that that trusting your life to that person and remember in the great commission it's you know go make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name one name not in the names, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is a, it's, that's in the name of God. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Now, the only way you could do that, because that's not works. The only way you could do that is by walking in the Spirit. And that's what the whole New Testament is telling us. Like, you put off the old man and put on the new man. Jesus is very clear about, you know, what must I do to be doing the works of God. This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. That you believe in who? The servant. Who's him whom he sent? It's the servant. God, Jesus. So yeah, when Christians say, I just have to believe that Jesus is God and then I can live however I want, Paul says in Romans um, 5 or 6, should I, so should I sin more that grace may abound? May it never be. That means you're not a Christian. If you have that attitude, you are not calling upon the name of the Lord to be saved. <laughs> so that's, yeah, I appreciate that question. Yeah. So behold all you who kindle a fire, who equip yourselves with burning torches, walk by the light of your fire and by the torches that you have kindled. This you have from my hand, you shall lie down in torment. <laughs> it kind of frames the whole chapter because at the beginning he's saying, like, again, what, like, where's the certificate of divorce? I'm, although I did send you for your sins into exile. And here he's saying, 
from my hand, you will lie down in torment. So once again, there's a division. You're either represented by the servant or you're represented by your own light. <laughs> so are you in this category? You fear the Lord, obey the voice of the servant, trust in the name of the Lord, rely on his God. Or are you in this category? You're kindling your own fire and walking by the light of your fire. I mean, so get this, right? Light and darkness. Light meaning understanding. Darkness is we're, we're, we're not in understanding. So you're making your own understanding. You're kindling your own fire. And now you're walking by your own understanding. You know, this is Romans 1. I mean, it's, it's, they reject God as God. They decide to do their own thing and they walk in that way, you know. Or... Uh, we don't need to do that one. God, so in 1 Corinthians, it speaks about this. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised. I mean, think back to that. Remember, he's being disgraced and shamed. God chooses what's low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. People who think highly of themselves. <laughs> so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And in the middle there it says, for the word of the cross is foolish, uh, folly or foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. And so the, the difference is, are you going to walk according to your own light? That's actually darkness. <laughs> or are you going to walk according to the light of Jesus Christ? And this goes back to that, Jesus says, what does he say? I did not come to save who? The righteous. I came to save who? The sinners. So this is, this is the, it's a beautiful parallel here. Jesus comes to save those who know they are walking in darkness. And not those who think they're walking in light. Do you get it? When Jesus says, I have not come to save the righteous, we know no one is righteous, no, not one. But he's saying, I've, 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 I've not come to save those who think they are righteous. I have come to save. Now, everybody's a sinner. So when he says, I've come to save sinners, he's not simply saying, I've come to save, because he's, he, so I've, I have not come to save those who think they are righteous. I have come to save those who know they are sinners. That's what this is saying. Let him who knows they are walking in darkness and knows they have no light come into the light by the servant. If you think you have light, you're getting judgment. <laughs> and so just to conclude, I see Shannon giving me the signal here. Um, I have these boxes on your sheet. How does Mark 8, 17 and 18 relate to this chapter? And so that was the sermon I preached last week, which was, do you not have eyes to see and ears to hear? And then Jesus does what? He, he heals a deaf guy and he heals a blind guy to say, I'm the one who gives, opens eyes and opens ears. And then we see all the places that light and darkness is, is meant to talk about blindness and sight spiritually, right? And so look at the text and look at all the circles I have here. That's what this is talking about. So right up at the top, that big long oval, when I called, was there no one to answer? In other words, I called you and you didn't hear me. But then you look at the servant in verse 4, he awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear. In other words, all the people have deafness, but the servant has an ear to hear. So then at the bottom... I didn't, I didn't circle that. But verse 10, all who, who obey the voice of the servant. In other words, now the people can hear. Because if you're going to obey the voice, you have to hear the voice. And people walking in darkness are blind. And then the second, the last box there, how does Romans 8, 1, 31 to 39 relate to this chapter? And this is just, this is the beautiful takeaway of this. This is why he is the, the true Israel, and then we are in him, the Israel of God. 
Because verses 8 and 9, when Jesus says, who vindicates, he who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear it like a garment, like the moth. It sounds very much like Romans 8. But who is Romans 8 applied to? So remember, 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But later, Paul asks those same questions. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, the servant, but gave him up for us, how will he not also graciously give us all things? Now here it is. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that was raised to the right hand of God who is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Verse 37, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That's what this is saying in 8 and 9. Jesus is, as the servant, as our representative, is saying before the Father, people are, are coming to disgrace me, they're hitting me, they're spitting on me, they're bringing shame to me, but... I trust in the Lord. In that case, who will contend with me? Who is my adversary? Who will declare me guilty? That's Romans 8 applied to us because we are in him. That when we are in the servant, trusting in him, we have no enemy that God cannot overcome. I mean, it would be silly to think of. It's like, it's like if a kindergartner were coming up and trying to beat us up. That's what the servant does for us. Because of his work, we become children. Remember, Israel is God's child, and then we are called God's child. So thank God for the servant and his work on our behalf. Let's pray.